And thanks so much for. <laughs> Maybe I should say it else. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much for, for organizing this and, and persevering in uh, making the conference happen. I'm uh, pleased to be here uh, to talk a bit about um, expressivism and inferentialism, um, especially as it pertains to normative concepts or normative terms such as ought. Um, so I come at this originally from a kind of meta-ethics point of view um, as it become clearer. And what I want to do with the um, talk is just um, explain a little bit how I get into the topic and think about what expressionism is and what um, inferentialism is. And I'll, I'll seek to kind of draw a contrast between um, expressivist approaches and uh, the sorts of inferentialist approaches that I tend to, um, to like instead, but I think one of the interesting things that'll probably happen in our discussion of my paper and then the rest of the conference is whether those contrasts are uh, as stark as I sometimes make them out to be, um, or whether there's uh, uh, convenient uh, avenues for sort of collaboration between the two approaches. Um, let me start with a quote from Enoch. Um, I was recently teaching meta ethics, um, and uh, we did a, a, a week on non-naturalism, and my students got this, and, uh, and so, I try not to, um, uh, not to get too offended by the quote from my students, but the, the quotes are offended me, I want to say why. Um, so he says, there's a sense in which non-naturalist realism has to be the starting point. Other views enter the field, as it were, on the strength of some argument. Non-naturalist realism is the default position, and arguments are needed to defeat it, not so much to establish it. How so? The first thing to note is that moral, and more broadly, normal <laughs> language behaves very much like other representational language. Uh, linguistically speaking, it's very hard to tell apart gender discrimination is common and gender discrimination is wrong. Um, and then he goes through a, a number of features that many of us are familiar with. Um, both normative language and descriptive language fit within assertion and denial, both in better true and false, both can be um, put into the uh, content of belief attribution or and other propositional attitude reports. Um, he also talks about, which isn't exactly linguistic evidence, but uh, maybe more of an intuition about the role of the discourse um, that both have a kind of objective purport. Uh, we don't, um, we, when we disagree about, um, about either matter, we think there's something we're disagreeing about that could potentially be settled is, um, is his primary datum. Um, but, but also it doesn't really make sense to embed uh, typical normative claims in um, uh, I find that or other markers of uh, kind of non-objectivity or subjectivity um, so these are uh, sort of similarities across the descriptive normative um, ways that we use uh, language. Um, but my initial reaction is to say, no, it's actually quite easy to tell apart um, the way we use normative language, at least the language of oughts. Um, linguistically speaking, it's actually um, quite easy to tell apart. Gender discrimination is common. And then I'll switch the example to something more clearly um, normative and easy not, gender discrim discrimination ought not to occur or ought not to be common, if you like. So the first sentence um, uh, looks to be a sentence about the way reality is, whereas the second sentence looks to be a sentence about the way reality ought to be. Um, it's the kind of very uh, flat-footed way that I'd like to understand that um, distinction. And then if you want to be a bit more precise in the linguistics, um, the second sentence with the ought, uh, the primary uh, predicate is an intentional operator, um, whereas with the first sentence, the primary predicate uh, looks like some kind of uh, um, descriptive or empirical predication. Um, now, I don't mean to say that all uses of intentional operators and modal operators are non-descriptive just because of that. Maybe we have um, some intentional operators like historical modalities or ability modalities that we should think of as uh, or statements of that, uh, natural law that we should think of as descriptive in the end or representational in the end of our analysis. But I think it requires some argument there. You can't take that as a starting point um, because we have others where it's quite natural to think that their representationality and reality is quite uh, controversial and, and maybe should be nice. We have epistemic modals. Um, we have um, the deontic modals as the kind of example highlights. Um, uh, we have other um, you know, future contentions that it's quite unclear whether we should think of those as, uh, that when treated as a potential operator as, um, as describing the future. Um, so things like that make me think um, Enoch's starting point can't be the starting point. Um, moreover, um, it looks like, going back to our two sentences, uh, the second sentence, gender discrimination ought not occur, seems to imply or bear some kind of semantic relationship to 
um, imperatives of various sorts, at least in a way that the first one doesn't. So um, if we agree that uh, that true is two, uh, two is true, then it looks like um, uh, we can assent to the legitimacy of an imperative like um, uh, don't engage in gender discrimination or uh, do what you can to prevent gender discrimination, something like that. So there's this imperative connection um, that um, is another reason to suspect that uh, representationism, representation, treaties with representation shouldn't be a starting point. Moving then to meta ethics more properly, um, there's the kind of famous um, challenge to thinking about all things as representational. Uh, I call this the representational quandary. Um, insofar as we think of all claims as categorical or um, full blooded or robustly normative, um, it's not obvious how to fit uh, such odds or the things they, uh, according to Eva Kudu, would uh, describe. Um, and the rights and wrongs and goods and bads that entail them. It's not easy, it's not easy to see how to fit those cleaning, cleaning amongst the national properties and relations because instantiation is knowable through observation of probably scientific methods. I mean, this, this is, of course, even knows this is why he's a non-naturalist and he thinks that uh, we don't fit them amongst the, uh, the natural stuff. Um, uh, but I think, if anything, naturalism is the default view in contemporary metaethics, not, um, uh, not Enoch's view. Uh, so for those contrasts, linguistic contrasts between probably uh, kind of semantic contrast between um, one and two, and then also for this um, more traditional reason in metaethics, um, I'm inclined to think that non-naturalist realism is far from the default view, uh, but instead some kind of non-representationalism is the um, way we should start our theorizing about normative odds. Um, I won't necessarily say it's the default view, but um, it's where I start uh, thought and talk about what people categorically ought to do, um, categorically ought to do, think, and feel. So all of those uh, seems to be fundamentally different from thought and talk about how reality is. Uh, the latter, uh, I'm happy to say, describes or represents reality, but the former seems to regulate our reasoning and uh, add to the responses to reality rather than um, in our, in our um, uh, performing various actions in response to the way we think reality to be. Um, so that's the, the contrast I'm interested in. Now the really kind of key question um, for meta ethics, I think, and for us more generally in philosophy is uh, what do we do with that? Where do we go? And so that's where I want to kind of sketch two pictures here where we can go. Um, I'll put a few desiderata out there. I'll put um, desiderata um, out for our uh, answer to this question uh, where we want to go. Um, and then we'll see at the end how what we do with those. Mm -hmm. um, so one very general desiderata is that our ultimate view should fit um, uh, broader views about how language works. Um, and I have in mind especially those things that Enoch noted, uh, the various ways that all claims can embed. Um, uh, but also the thing I noted that all claims uh, seem to be uh, modal as an intentional operator uh, in a way that's different than the is common claims. Um, second desiderata, uh, we want to maintain an intelligible distinction between uh, normative thought and talk and descriptive thought and talk. So um, I see it as a, like uh, we've lost the game if in the end we collapse these completely and we can't make this, can't draw the distinction anymore. Um, third is around um, capture the apparently um, semantic or logical connections between normative odds and prescriptions. So that uh, suggestion that um, when, us, when we agree that somebody ought to do something, oh, uh, we should also think that various imperatives are going to be uh, uh, legitimate or valid. Um, and finally, makes sense of the objective purport in normative thought and talk. Um, the fact that many normative claims seem to be true, but not just that we call them true, but they have, um, uh, we want to scratch that itch that, that Eli articulates when he's worried about objective purport. Um, that drives, I think, a lot of the motivation towards the kind of non-nationalism. Okay, so those are my four desiderata. Um, let me now tell you just a little bit about how C expresses it. So the standard view, as many of you know, in um, meta-ethics to uh, meet these desiderata to make sense of a non-representational view um, is the kind of expressivism I have in left mind of the, the sorts of views that we associate with um, a Gibber, Blackburn, Ridge, and, and, and many others. Um, uh, the, their view, I think, of as sort of first and foremost, the view about evaluative language 
um, that then can maybe get extended to cover all uh, normative language as well. So something like charity is good or maybe merge wrong um, uh, uh, is the focus. And then we'll think about how it extends to, to all claims. Um, and, uh, and I'll just take as kind of given that I hope most people understand the kind of refinements of those views that have happened over the years. So we're not talking about kind of uh, old school non-cognitivism um, or even kind of norm, norm expressivism a la Gibbard. Um, We'll, we'll add in kind of quasi-realist ideas where we rehabilitate notions like truth and belief and fact and, and win the right to, to speak with those notions when we use these norm, normative claims understood expressivistically and even the kind of hybrid expressivist view um, where we say that there might be descriptive content that's expressed but also normative content that are linked in certain ways so we say that um, the normative claims uh, uh, carry both kinds of content but what makes it express this is that it doesn't carry descriptive content about those categories or categorical normative properties. Um, there we get the explanation um, proceeding somehow in terms of expression. So what's what's the expressive idea? What's the expression that's involved here? Um, the way I think about this is to use a very general background theory of meaningfulness, or if we want to put terms on it, a meta-semantic view um, that inter interacts with the kind of pragmatic view, pra view about pragmatics. I think this is kind of a locking rising program. So the basic thought is, um, uh, where language gets its meaning from, or what language is for such that it has meaning is to express our minds, to make outer what's inner, to communicate uh, the mental states we're in to each other, to our audiences. Um, and so there's um, various conventions that arise uh, around the use of particular sounds and particular signs that uh, then get linked up in various ways to uh, the mental states we're in and the uh, project of explaining meaningfulness is, is understanding those linkages. How, do, how does language uh, conventionally link to, um, uh, to bits of our minds such that we can convey to others what uh, mental state we're in? So I think that is the kind of general program, and this is partly going towards the idea that we want to fit with kind of more general views about um, uh, language that are defensible. Um, but to get a um, to get a, a view that's non-representational about normative language, we deploy the expressivist deploys a um, Humean distinction or the Anscombian distinction between different directions of fit. Um, so we have mental states that um, are such that they should fit the world, and mental states that are such that they uh, the world should be brought to fit them. Um, and we need both in explaining uh, why people are motivated to act. Um, and the expressive says that the normative claims, in the end of the day, primarily or most fundamentally, convey one of these latter, um, the world should be brought to fit the mind, uh, mental states. That's why um, normative claims aren't representations of reality. Um, some of the expressives have tried to develop um, various compositional semantics. Um, I mean, I think often thought to be with very limited success, although the type of um, uh, uh, universal quantification or world norm pairs that uh, Gibbard uses uh, begins to look very much like uh, many of the um, uh, intentional semantics that people use for uh, modal claims more generally. So that's, I think, an attractive thing if we can make it to work. Um, the thought basically is that we need um, a, uh, a semantics that has shiftable indices that we can, um, that we can also quantify over to, uh, to make sense of some of the behavior of modal claims and um, and to fit the behavior of modal claims in with um, a more traditional truth conditional semantics. Um, so I think there's some prospects there for, um, for compositional semantics. I'll, I didn't see, I'll, I'll raise that as one of the worries. Um, so that's how I see the view. We combine the Lockean, uh, Bryceian meta semantic pragmatic story with a Humean uh, and Scomian functional role story. Um, to get a picture of normative language that possibly, whose semantics possibly fits in an intuitive way with broader um, theories and intentional semantics. Um, but nonetheless, the, uh, at the bottom, the explanation of why sentences have the meaning they do, um, the normative sentences is going to appeal to um, their conventional role to express these non representational mental states. Um, so I think I'll, we'll probably hear about several other kinds of expressivism throughout this conference. And that's the one that I think uh, the, when I say I'm not a big fan of expressivism, it's this combination of constellation of ideas that I'm not a big fan of and want to suggest an alternative. Um, but first, let's talk about why people like this view. Um, of course, it 
avoids the ontological commitment to values being out there as part of reality. So if you're moved by the representational quandary, then um, this is a, that, that's a good making feature of this view. Um, this view also, and I think this is one of the um, things that moves people on meta ethics the most, is this view uh, promises to have the best explanation of uh, the apparently necessary or at least tight connections between uh, normative claims, or at least our normative concepts and motivation. Um, so if the claims express a state that could be uh, part of a belief, desire, um, functional characterization of, 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 of psychology and motivation, then that's um, a pretty good reason to think that uh, one who endorses the, 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 the claim is going to be motivated in certain ways. Um, and so it's, we get the, the materials for an explanation of what's called motivational internalism. Um, and these views also fit with a, a kind of um, intuitive and I think natural so respectable account of the coordinative function of expressed facts. So like, why do we go around expressing our mental states to each other? Why do we need the convention so that we can uh, convey uh, what's in our minds to each other? Well, in part, that's to coordinate on uh, various uh, things that have, so that we each come to have very similar or exactly the same um, uh, mental states um, and then can act together in, um, in cooperative ways. Um, Good, okay, so those are advantages. Here are the standard challenges. So as I mentioned, many people worry that the semantics is ultimately not gonna be what we can integrate into our best understanding of, um, of uh, the way uh, the semantic values of the whole sentences is composed of the semantic values of its parts, especially when you start to think about um, conditionals, intentional operators, including uh, uh, the ontic ones, but also things like uh, might, must, and, um, and uh, various prob probability operators. Um, uh, so I think there's some question about whether we're ultimately going to be able to satisfy this round one. I think it requires books and books and books to really settle that, so we won't do that here. But um, but just to mention that as a as a worry. Um, second one that kind of moves me a bit more. Um, I think. Um, Whatever we say exactly about the, how we do the compositional semantics, I think there's a question about whether expressiveness can plausibly identify the mental states that are expressed. What is the convention that links up to our mind um, a sentence that's logically mixed um, in various ways? Um, how do we explain what, uh, how do we identify and characterize both the type and content of the mental state that's expressed by a disjunction, which has a normative component? Um, and there's, again, books written about this, but um, the views, I think, that go farthest towards meeting this disneuratum or avoiding this subjection are ones that end up saying that, that all sentences are conventionally linked to the same kind of mental state. Um, so either it's a state of being for, as Mark Schroeder's proposal, or it's a, um, a hybrid state that includes a kind of endorsement of a, of a um, normative perspective and uh, beliefs about what that normative perspective uh, requires, which is Mike Rich's view, but um, I think in the end of the day, um, we end up uh, collapsing as a result the uh, uh, distinction between uh, the sentences that we think of as expressing representations of reality and the sentences we think of as um, expressing uh, this other kind of mental state, because we need, in order to make the uh, account of the moral psychology and the, the, my, the content and type of mental state to work, we need um, uh, uh, we need one state eventually linked to um, all of these uh, different mixed sentences. Um, so I, that's that I take to be a key liability. Again, books have been written, and we're probably not going to settle where that's um, uh, the you know what the right answer about that is today. But um, but I'll mention that there because it motivates a bit what I want to say later. Um, and finally, I think there's been a lot of discussion about whether uh, in attempting to um, win the right to use. Uh, um, words like true and belief and fact uh, about normative claims, uh, which express this do by adopting you know, some kind of minimalism. Um, there's a worry that, that anything you kind of grasp onto to continue to make the distinction between the representational and the non-representational um, also gets eaten up by uh, our minimalism. So minimalism creeps through um, all the notions of might uh, used to distinguish about. There's I mean, people I know in this room have written papers where they argue there's various ways to solve this, um, including myself. Um, uh, but I think that's still a, a kind of worry. But and even, if, even if we do ultimately um, 
uh, stop the creep of minimalism from eating up everything that you might have wanted to use to distinguish uh, representationalist and non-representationalist views. Um, I think there's probably still kind of related worry that expresses um, don't expresses them at least as I've understood it so far um, doesn't really uh, capture the character of normative disagreement and the possibility of normative knowledge. Um, so if we're allowed to say I believe in the fact that um, uh, gender discrimination ought to be uh, ought not to happen, um, what's expressed the story about uh, me knowing that or you knowing that? Um, that I think remains a difficult thing for um, expressives to explain. Um, so those are kind of, I think the standard challenges, let me just mention one more. Um, the, and this has to do with the connection to um, imperatives. Um, and I mean, that's gonna be a kind of debatable disagreement, I guess, but um, if you share my intuition that um, at least sometimes when we think that, we think uh, uh, one ought not murder, and we all agree to that, and from that, you can then say, uh, Luca, don't murder. Um, if there's some logical or, or um, uh, semantic uh, support between those two, um, then it's not really clear to me that the expressions can explain that. At least the idea of expressing my approval, disapproval, or what I'm for, or my acceptance of a set of norms, or my endorsement of a normative perspective, all those things um, don't yet look to me like the sort of thing that, to put it in a kind of pragmatic way, would license and license the, the insertion of a, of a imperative on our collective to do this. Uh, uh, why do we get that? Why do we get from there's some things that, of course, I disapprove of, but that doesn't mean I get to tell you to stop doing them. <laughs> and there's some things that I, I'm really for, but, um, but it requires something more to uh, license um, the issuing of a, of a command uh, to others to do it. Um, and so, um, how, how does Expresses explain that is um, one of the things I'm concerned about. Good, okay, so that's how I see Expressivism, some of the advantages um, and um, what I see as some of the liabilities. And I'll, I'll kind of focus on B and C, so the, the idea that um, identifying the mental state is difficult, um, identifying the mental state and the mental state type is difficult once we add in various logical connectives um, and Identifying the semantic connection to imperatives is also challenging. Um, okay, alternative approach. So, why I think of inferentialism as something different, um, not a version of that view, although it has bare certain similarities, um, uh, has to do, I guess, there's like some ideas out there in uh, philosophical space that I think aren't really about this, that I inspired by and then there's like a way of starting to develop a view that's a competitor to this so the idea is not sorry again advances so a few ideas out there in philosophical space that, that can at least maybe soften people up for an alternative um so one is this uh, in discussions of episode modals might may must um this idea that um we uh, should understand the meaning of those either uh, pragmatics into the way we think of uh, the meta semantics for the claim or directly in the semantics, um, not in terms of, um, not in the kind of traditional terms you get from traditional semantics, but, um, but rather in terms of a test of con uh, context. So the thought is we don't add anything new to the common ground um, or the discourse, um, the uh, set of information that's the that, that constitutes the, the discourse context. We don't have anything new to that um, when we say that it might rain. Um, what we do is we check whether uh, the thing embedded, it's raining or it will rain, um, uh, is consistent with various bits of the discourse context. So thinking of epistemic modals as, uh, in some sense, checks of, or tests of context um, is uh, an idea that I think is kind of interesting in the epistemic modal case, and I'm interested in how it might be extended. Um, another kernel of an idea, so um, modal normativists, uh, people like um, uh, Amy Thomason and, um, and Bob Brandom think that um, uh, certain kinds of necessity claims are, um, are not descriptions of things, essences, and not descriptions of modal space, but rather um, uh, Perform, they get their meaning from performing different functions. So the thought is that at least analytic and logical necessity uh, claims are ways to institute 
acknowledge the consequences of or propose changes to the rules for how to reason their concepts. Um, so they thought it's going to be like, if I say uh, necessarily bachelors are men, that necessarily um, indicates that what, what we're doing there is one of these things. We're either instituting the way to use the concept bachelor, so a rule about how to use the concept bachelor, or we're drawing a consequence from a rule we take ourselves to have uh, accepted tacitly, um, or in some cases, maybe we're proposing a new uh, way to use the word or concept. Um, uh, so that's a different idea that um, has uh, inspired me a little bit. Um, and finally, the idea and kind of minimalist or deflation theories of truth um, that the truth predicate uh, facilitates various, doesn't describe a property that a substance property that uh, sentences or beliefs have, but rather facilitates various linguistic, meta linguistic operations on um, content that we've already taken, um, uh, that we already believe, or we've already asserted, um, or somebody's believed, or somebody's asserted. So, like that. so that, that's kind of another idea. So the, the thing I like about all of these ideas, no, None of them, I think, can be extended straightforwardly to the normative case, but the thing I like about all these ideas is that they, they do treat their um, target uh, expressions as non-representational. So they treat might or um, uh, analytically necessary or must or uh, is true as non-representational, um, but they don't treat it as non-representational in virtue of the expression of a um, of a motivational attitude, or even really the, the story about why it's not representational doesn't advert to the moral psychology at all. Um, it averts rather to something about the way the um, conventions are set up um, in the use of those claims to do various things within um, kind of shared discursive practice um, rather than the uh, conveying this thing that's presumed to be about um, Marty. Uh, uh, and assume they exist in there in our head. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is they, they treat uh, their target expressions in, as in a sense second order. So you, you don't have anything to do with might um, until you have uh, concepts like rain. <laughs> um, you can't just think something might be true when there's not a something there that, that might be true. So you have to have something onto which the might uh, attaches or um, same thing with the truth predicate. If it's something onto which the truth predicate attaches, um, uh, or even the necessary. So necessarily bachelors are male. Needs the you need the ideas of bachelors are male first, um, so that the necessity motive can then attach to that. So I think there's this, something attractive about thinking about the um, uh, the reason that these operators are non-representational has something to do with their second orderness. And this will tie into my thought that what we want to make sense of is um, how normative claims, normative oughts, function to regulate reasoning and action and attitudes uh, rather than to describe the way reality is. But how do we get from those kind of kernels of ideas to more full-blooded theory? Well, here's a quick run into the way I think of metaethical inferentialism. So the first move is to um, replace that Locke and Gricean uh, explanation of meaningfulness with a what I think is a Persian to Marsian explanation of meaningfulness. The key there is that you think of um, what claims are for, what assertions are for, is not in the first instance to express our minds or express our beliefs, but rather in the first instance is to undertake a particular kind of discursive commitment. Um, undertake a commitment that you're mutually recognized as undertaking when you say something. Um, we can think about this in terms of conversational pragmatics. Um, you know, you're putting something on the scoreboard. You're, you're seeking to get um, a proposition that P mutually accepted um, within the conversational context. Um, uh, and then if we talk about the mental state express, that comes secondarily or later in the story. Um, so meaningfulness is explained in terms of this undertaking of a commitment. And then what kind of commitment? Well, here's the Salarzian bit. Um, the commitment, and maybe there's different ways to do this, but, but as I think of it, the commitment um, is uh, a, a, you're undertaking a responsibility to back up the claim of reasons. Um, if asked, then that's defeasible. Um, and also you're granting an entitlement to everyone else you're talking to, to use that claim, that proposition as a reason, their further reasoning. 
uh, our further reasoning about what to do, think, and feel. So you get this kind of upstream responsibility and downstream uh, entitlement that's um, born by the commitment to the, I think we could say, the commitment to the truth of the proposition expressed by the, the sentence. Um, as a kind of, I know that's kind of a, a, a lot of moving parts, so just as a kind of rough heuristic, um, I think the model here is roughly expressed. The locking Bryson thinks of assertion on the model of, it seems to me that P. Um, and the uh, uh, Percy and Salarzian thinks of assertion on the model of, let's accept that P. Um, and so, I mean, of course, both sides can say both things, but that, if that might help you see the, the difference I'm trying to draw, um, I think that attaches to the types of norms that we think of as um, most relevant for investigating the, uh, uh, the semantics and pragmatics of the language. So do we think of those norms as sincerity norms? Um, so when somebody says something, it's the first thing you're thinking about uh, whether they really think what they purport to think, because their mind really is they purport to have it. Are they sincere? Um, that's the kind of locking Bryson uh, focus on, it seems to me, and yeah, that's right, you say, it seems to me, then one thing you might think about is like, does it really seem to that person uh, that he, um, whereas on the uh, Percy and Salarzian side of things, we focus on norms of justifiability or resource. Is this a reasonable thing for us to collectively accept in our conversational context? Um, uh, or is this person just crazy? <laughs> or is this person, uh, and you know, uh, speaking, I, I love the British one, speaking bollocks. Um, um, so that's the kind of contrast. You focus not on sincerity. You might, you might not even really be able to tell. And in some cases, it might not even matter um, whether the person really has the mental state, um, uh, whether they're sincere. What matters is whether um, it seems like a reasonable thing to add to the, uh, the, the common ground. Um, I think this is helpful for various purposes outside of this one, just to mention once I've been thinking a little bit about um, uh, the role of kind of uh, public discourse and public policy debates, and and there, I think there's a little bit too much focus on our on our, in our politics on whether politicians really think what they say they think, um, and we should focus a bit more on whether they what they say is something they can back up with reasons, um, and um, and I think that's partly because once you get at certain levels of debates. It's not even, I'm not even completely sure I want to attribute mental states to the relevant actors um, uh, or, or with, I don't feel like we have uh, you know, a lot of evidence to do that, but I think we can talk about um, what things count as reasons for what um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of social discursive space. Um, okay, so that's the kind of first or second move, first and second move, um, a Persian focus on treating assertions on the model of it, let's accept that and the Solarzian idea that um, part of what you're committing to is this is inferentially articulated. So in the kind of full dress version of this, I think that's what explains the meaningfulness of uh, different claims is um, the difference between um, the types of things that count as support for that claim and types of things that that claim that counts as support for. Um, in fact, I guess that's, I think that's part of why we, we probe uh, content in part by thinking about intuitions of consistency and entailment. Um, we should add to that, uh, I know I kind of already have, and like I said, an expanded notion of uh, common ground, um, and we need a kind of correlative expansions of, uh, or refinements of a uh, broadly scorekeeping model of, um, of, of uh, conventional discourse, and we're going to want to integrate this with our, uh, um, our understanding of um, intentional semantics with shiftable indices. Um, I'm just kind of waving my hand at things I know people <laughs> are interested in. Um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done kind of in each of those things to work out the, the details, but that's the kind of uh, the general picture. Um, uh, we, uh, we have this uh, Percy and Salarzian uh, background or, or foundational theory of meaning, what grounds meaningfulness, and then we you know, need to work that in with other things we know about language, but I think that's possible. Um, and then um, the, the last thing to kind of get to the non-representationalism about um, all kinds of like, uh, we need to posit a distinction between updates to factual information and conversational context and updates to mutually recognized norms. Um, these I think of as like having, uh, uh, affecting different positions in the conversational school board. Um, and I guess in particular, what will be relevant later is, um, I think some normal claims can, uh, amongst perhaps other things, add, uh, imperatives to to do this in the common ground to the uh, mutually recognized list of things people are committed to doing. Um, 
Okay, so then going to the Hawkeye specifically, uh, meta ethical inferentialism about um, normative claims would say that the normative claim functions to undertake a distinctive kind of mutually recognized commitment, one which can be articulated in terms of the types of reasons that count in favor of it and the types of things that it counts in favor of. Um, and um, what makes this different? Well, there's, I think, a few ideas. I'm not quite sure how these all fit together. But part of why I think this makes it different from descriptive uh, claims is, is that this conversational move, making a normative claim, um, function, functions not to uh, describe the way reality is, but rather to institute um, a rule or acknowledge the consequences of a rule or propose changes to mutually accepted norms or rules about which things you would feel. So if you use that kind of idea that came from uh, uh, Thomas and random, but I, I guess you could think of that as a, that's like what we're doing when we're checking. <laughs> well, similarly, we're checking to see what follows from the norms we already accept and everything else we accept. Um, but sometimes we're um, proposing a new rule or we're um, uh, proposing a change rule. Um, those those can be part of what you're doing, but the uh, the key is that you're not describing. Uh, but that'll have the, uh, characteristic effects in the common ground. Um, add to do list, as I mentioned, but also update other things. Um, and this is the thing I'd be interested to talk to people in more detail about and requires me giving out a piece of paper and writing things down. But I feel like this is uh, this general picture is consistent with, and in fact, partly motivated by how I got into this idea um, was thinking about broadly intentional semantics on the kind of Lewisian Kratzer um, framework, but but with extra indices um, uh, to help make sense of certain kinds of linguistic data. Uh, that doesn't look like it can be straightforwardly made sense of it, the kind of standard Kratzer view of, of, um, uh, of ne necessary and, and possibly. Um, but I think it's it still can, I mean, the, the, the picture is probably the same. And I think that does help um, uh, so much make sense of uh, how compositionality works in these in these sentences. Um, okay, good. I'm just trying to think what to do. I'll take about five more minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, five or seven more minutes. So um, I've anticipated a little bit of this already, but um, why, why might you think this view is better than the expressing view that I, um, that I outlined before? Um, well, like I just said, it's partly motivated by a, what I think of as a pretty good intentional semantic story for how to integrate modals and more broadly intentional operators into a composition of semantics that's broadly uh, truth conditional and it's, uh, it was inspiration. Um, uh, the second advantage is that, at least from my point of view, I see this advantage is that the distinction between descriptive and non-descriptive uh, thought and talk is not drawn in the uh, moral psychology, which I think we have mushy intuitions about, um, even that claim that uh, all claims are tightly connected to motivation. I think works best when we're talking about um, uh, actions that I myself could do in the future. Um, when we're talking about things that maybe happened in the past, or um, collectives who I could never be in the position of, or we're talking about things like uh, attitudes, like beliefs and and um, anger, things we don't have voluntary control over. Um, I think the the idea that there's this tight connection between the all claim and the um, and the motivation gets uh, much dodgier, much weaker. Um, and so from my point of view, that it's, that's fine because we're not drawing, uh, we don't lose the distinction between descriptive and, and non-descriptive there uh, because we've drawn the distinction in the semantics pragmatics interface rather than moral psychology. And so I think that allows this distinction to be, to be explained as an instance of a more general phenomenon. Um, so the thought is that in general, part of what's going on with um, uh, intentional operators is they have this like uh, modal modal verbs is they have this um, complex semantics which is probably second order in the sense it's operating on first order content um, and uh, and that interacts in, in very uh, in not straightforward ways with the common ground um, or the discord the, the scoreboard of the of the conversation we're not just adding more factual or descriptive information to the scoreboard when we use these things. Uh, we're doing something else, um, and so um, that's where the uh, the uh, argument that these are, are are not, or at least not straightforward representational, is is coming. Um, 
Um, and then I think we can use the kind of quasi realism of minimalism about truth, belief, and fact. Um, uh, I guess that's to be put my cards more fully on the table. I don't think we should use the minimalism, but I think we should be kind of pluralist about those notions and recognize that there are uh, propositions about how empirical reality is, there are propositions about um, how we ought to behave, there's propositions about um, uh, mathematical truth, there's propositions about um, uh, whether it might or might not rain tomorrow. Um, those are a bunch of different types of propositions, and we should think about uh, different types of truth and then have a pluralist view of propositionality and truth, um, uh, but still hanging on to this thought that, um, the, at least in the normative case, the, the operator is kind of a second order operator, I think, uh, provides some guard against this collapsing um, uh, via minimalism or whatever you want to say about truth, collapsing into a view where we have no distinction between what's representational reality and what's not. Um, yeah, I've already, um, oh, the imperative thing. So if undertaking discursive commitment involves granting inferential entitlements, uh, the one thing that might possibly, uh, plausibly be thought to follow from various normative claims, I think is imperatives. Uh, and that would explain how their discourse function um, includes updating people to do this and hopefully at least provide the grounds for um, that logical semantical suggestion in the beginning that there's a connection between um, uh, all things and imperatives. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave the other uh, advantages, more general advantages uh, of the presentation. They're on the handle there. Um, you might wonder uh, could it be ecumen ecumenical? Could we say, like, well, there's some aspects of meaning that are explained by um, in the kind of Lockean story about how we um, convey our minds to other people, and there's other aspects of meaning that are explained in more the, the person story about what we we're undertaking commitments to. Um, and I think that's right, broadly speaking. Um, it's just that I, I think the uh, the focus when I'm focused on um, a uh, assertory claim made with an odd sense um, doesn't doesn't look like the right focus for the kind of Lockean and Dreisian story to be the most fundamental story. So when we're talking about how does the word "ouch" get its meaning, or how does the word um, uh, "hurrah" get its meaning, or "thanks" or "please," um, some of those I think the expressive story is quite plausible as like as deep as it goes. Um, but when we're talking about things for which we can give reasons and things that we can infer things from, um, then I think this uh, more socially discursive uh, uh, story, which locates, I mean, to use kind of metaphorical language, locates meaning in the social discursive normative space of conversation rather than um, in the first instance in people's minds, um, is a is a a, a a kind of more foundational story. It's, we're we're going to add on stuff about that expression of mental states later rather than start with expression of mental states. So insofar as we're ecumenical, I still think that the Persian Sarsian story sits deeper, um, at least deeper for um, things we think of as uh, claims, claims about something being true. So let's go back. Um, there's one of the Disarmament that I haven't talked about. And I want to go back to Enoch just to conclude. Um, so um, Enoch says, um, Moral discourse at least purports to be objective in roughly the way the usual empirical discourse is. Other differences remain, of course. And it clearly contrasts with discourse that are presumably paradigmatically non objective, such as about tastiness, coolness, or yuckiness. Uh, this will certainly not get us all the way to non naturalist realism, but he implies um, as a default position um, that it gets us to some kind of representation, it gets us to some kind of anti um, expressivism. Uh, uh, this objective purport, um, or the, more precisely, the similarity and objective purport between uh, normative claims and um, empirical claims. Um, now, so I think we know, most of us know the standard expresses move here is to insist that um, objective purport can be captured just as well in their theory as any other theory. Um, they have a story about what's going on when you say um, it's true that uh, you ought not steal. It's really true that you ought not steal. It's a fact that you ought not steal. In each case, you're still expressing an attitude, an attitude that doesn't represent the way reality is. Um, so, I mean, my question about this is, who's that going to convince? Um, so I think it does convince express this, um, uh, and there's like internal coherence to that story, um, but I doubt it's ever going to scratch the itch of someone like Enoch, um, and maybe Enoch's too 
uh, far in the other direction, too far gone to try to convince, but um, uh, neutral third parties who, um, who are worried about the objective uh, uh, purport of, of moral claims, worried about some of the data I mentioned very briefly at the beginning about how um, various expressives like saying it's tasty um, or it's great uh, embed under I find it, I find that, so that you find or um, other uh, discourse indicators of um, some kind of personality or personal or subjective opinion um, or even intersubjective opinion, but um, uh, norm normative claims um, that focus on um, there ought to be no gender discrimination or or is wrong. They don't know that in that way. So people who are interested in that kind of data, I think, are going to be, are going to be convinced by the quasi realist view. Whereas I think the idea that the idea of thinking these claims is undertaking a mutually recognized um, commitment um, that that helps to to win a kind of objective purport, but it's not an objective purport that is similar to the objective purport in, in empirical claims. I think it's different. I think they have different kinds of objective purport. So um, the objective purport of uh, these normative claims is like the object of purport of um, uh, analytic necessity claims or uh, epistemic motive claims or probability claims. So I think in all those cases, we don't think of them as um, we don't embed them in I find that, and we don't think of them as um, in any sense expressive of subjective attitudes. Um, but we also don't think of them as uh, objective in the sense that they have to match or, or, or describe uh, the way some mind independent reality is. Um, uh, they have a different kind of object of pur purport to put more flesh on that, but only a little bit more flesh. I think this kind of comes out in the way, if you follow me down the, uh, the kind of Salarzian version of the person story, this comes out in the way that uh, when somebody makes one of these claims, if you say it might rain tomorrow, or you say there ought to be um, uh, no gender discrimination, um, I can ask you for reasons, and then you can give reasons, and we can talk about whether those are good reasons or bad reasons. Um, and if we kind of agree that, okay, yeah, you've got some pretty good reasons, uh, maybe we don't know all the reasons, but we're going to accept that claim, then we can take that claim as a premise and we can infer further things downstream from that claim. This is true of the Mike claim, this is true of the uh, analytic necessity claim, this is true of the Deontay Moto claim. So that's fitting into the structure of things we can give reasons for and things we can reason it from, um, I think. Uh, fits nicely with uh, the thought that these do have objective purport, but um, we, we try to convince each other about them. This is the data that, that, that you know, is most moved by is that we stand our ground in discussion and try to give uh, reasons to back up our claims and convince other people that what we say is true and they're trying to do the same with us. We don't just say, uh, well, that's your attitude, this is my attitude, or, um, or no, I'm, it's true, it's true, it's true, <laughs> banging the table. Um, we, we can engage in this kind of reason giving. So I think that kind of fits better with, um, and the, I mean, the general message in respect to Enoch is that um, there are important differences between empirical claims and normative claims, um, but those differences are a difference about um, the type of mental state that whose conventional expression determines the meaning of the claim. Now, those differences are differences about the types of things that count as reasons in our discursive practice for those claims and the types of things they count as reasons for further down. So. Um, normative claims looks like they can look like they can um, license various imperatives, license various uh, intentions, license various actions, and um, and I think there's something important about the way that works that um, that shows those claims to be uh, not representations of the way reality is, not an attempted description of the way reality is, but um, rather undertaking a different kind of commitment, one that uh, plays the second order role of sort of structuring and guiding uh, reasoning. That we might engage in with, with our more first order concepts. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks very much.